Hey guys, so we're going to pick up where we left off talking about how plants acquire and transport nutrients. And now we're going to talk about plant growth and Liebig's law of the minimum. If you haven't watched the previous lectures that cover all of these other points, please check those out first. So Liebig's law of the minimum essentially states that the growth of any organism is controlled not by the total amount of resources available, but by the scarcest resource or the limiting factor. Okay, so although growth of an organism can be dependent on a number of different factors, it's really just one factor or the scarcest resource that limits growth. So a nice little metaphor to think about this is a barrel filled with water, okay? And water represents the growth of an organism, and each of the little planks that makes up the barrel represents a different nutrient. And what you can see is the water can only rise as high as the lowest plank or the limiting nutrient. So in this case, water is the limiting factor of the scarcest resource, and the barrel or the growth of the organism can only fill up as high as that lowest amount before it dumps over, okay? And so if you want to increase the growth, you've got to, in this case, increase the water. And as it turns out, if you look at the major nutrients that are limiting factors for most plants, it's nitrogen and phosphorus that are often the limiting nutrients. So look at, let's look at the results of the experimental evidence for Liebig's law of the minimum. And so this is basically looking at plant growth in a whole bunch of different experimental studies where they manipulated the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, or nitrogen and phosphorus in different environment types. So freshwater, marine, and terrestrial. So freshwater is like ponds and streams. Marine is like salt water, like oceans and seas. And terrestrial is, of course, of course, on land. And what they looked at is the overall response to fertilization with either nitrogen, phosphorus, or nitrogen and phosphorus. And the larger this bar is, the greater the increase in growth was as a result of adding these different nutrients across the baseline, which is sort of zero. So this represents if you don't add anything, you had no increase in growth. So given that, what's the limiting nutrient in plant productivity for terrestrial environments? Okay, so if you said both N and P, you would be correct. So here we're looking at terrestrial environments. And what you can see is when you add nitrogen, there's an increase of about 1.2. And if you add phosphorus, there's also an increase in growth about, of about 1.2. And so both of these individual nutrients look like they are limiting factors. But on top of that, if you add both nitrogen and phosphorus, you get even more growth. And so it seems what this means is that both nitrogen and phosphorus are limiting factors in this environment. And what we see is this is true across all of these different environments, whether you're in freshwater, marine, or terrestrial. Um, nitrogen and phosphorus both play a role in increasing growth, but nitrogen and phosphorus together increase growth very dramatically. And so those two things, both nitrogen and phosphorus, are the limiting factors. And so when we add them, we get a much greater increase in growth. So important take-homes from this sort of figure here is that nitrogen and phosphorus are often limiting nutrients for plant environments. Which nutrients is or are limiting depends on the habitat type. So for example, in marine, it appears that nitrogen itself is a little bit more limiting than phosphorus is. And you need experiments to know for sure. So without adding in these nutrients experimentally, we don't know what the limiting nutrient is, whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus or a combination of those two. So you need experiments to figure out what the limiting resource is. And so there's a lot of practical applications for Liebig's Law on the minimum. One of the most obvious ones is fertilizers themselves. So these are just different brands of fertilizer here. And oftentimes you'll hear fertilizers referred to as NPK, NPK, and different sort of ratios of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, like 23 to 10 to 6. And what this is is all about adding those nutrients that are typically limiting in an environment, okay? So let's think about some examples of fertilizers and what they do for plants by watching this video. The world of fertilizers can be complex, but it all hinges on three letters, N, P, and K. These are the three macronutrients that are essential for plant growth, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen gets top billing because it's responsible for keeping plants green, which is why fertilizers for grass tend to have a high N factor. 
Nitrogen also feeds new shoots and plant growth. Alfalfa meal, cottonseed meal, blood meal, and fish powder all are some of the most common amendments with a high nitrogen content. Phosphorus builds healthy roots and promotes fruiting and flowering, so you'll often see fertilizers for bulbs and blooms that are high in this nutrient. In nature, plants usually pick up phosphorus through decaying organic matter. You can apply it to your garden as rock phosphate, bone meal, and various liquid organic fertilizers. Potassium, which is also called potash, is key in the formation of chlorophyll and other plant compounds. It improves disease resistance and general plant health. It can be applied organically as sopol mag, green sand, and liquid fertilizers. When choosing a fertilizer. So the big point here is that fertilizers are all about understanding what is the limiting nutrient that's limiting plant growth and understanding this Liebig's law of the minimum and increasing that limiting nutrient so you can increase overall plant growth and yield, which obviously is important for things like agriculture and growing fruits and vegetables and all the sort of things that form the staple crops that we need for humanity to survive on a whole. Okay, so nitrogen, phosphorus, super important. Potassium is another important one, but mostly I want you guys to concentrate on nitrogen and phosphorus as major limiting factors. So other applications of this idea of Liebig's Law, the minimum. Maybe you guys have heard of toxic algal blooms like you see in this photo right here where there's a bunch of photosynthetic algae that's growing in this uh, lake or pond or whatever uh, waterway you may have. And sometimes they get so nasty through these harmful algal blooms that no swimming, swimming or wading is allowed. And you may have even seen some of these articles about dogs dying from toxic algae after swimming because there's toxins that get released by those algae. So one question is, why is it that we're seeing a lot of these harmful algal blooms? What's causing those? And as it turns out, once again, we're looking at nitrogen and phosphorus. So this is a great example of an experiment that was done where basically they took a lake and they split it in half with a divider. And to one half of the lake, they added carbon and nitrogen fertilizers, okay? And what you can see here is this represents normal sort of colored water. So adding calcium or carbon and nitrogen did not make a difference in the algal bloom. But when you added phosphorus to the mix, there was a big algal bloom. And so this came across as experimental evidence to show that adding both nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers pushed algae over this limiting factor. So phosphorus was a major limiting factor that limited the growth of algae. But when you added phosphorus, it allowed these harmful algal blooms to happen. So as it turns out, a big reason or underlying cause for a lot of these algal blooms is because algal growth is limited by phosphorus availability, but when people use a lot of fertilizers and those fertilizers end, get, end up getting leached out from farms and things like that into local waterways, it can reduce the limitation of phosphorus and cause these large algal blooms. Other applications of Liebig's Law of the Minimum are the use of biofuels. So a lot of biofuels are based on photosynthetic organisms and growing basically algae and what you need to figure out in order to grow as much algae as possible, as efficiently as possible, is figure out what's the limiting factor that's limiting growth. Is it sunlight? Is it water? Is it some sort of macronutrient? Is it some sort of micronutrient? And balancing all of those things perfectly so you can get the maximum amount of yield or algae growth. And so this is a great application of Liebig's Law in the minimum, tweaking all the nutrients available to make them just perfect to maximize the output of algal growth and produce produce as much biofuel as possible. Okay, so these are a couple important take-home messages from this plant nutrition acquisition and transport section. I'm not going to read through all of these, but this would be a great opportunity for you to just sort of hit pause and read through all of these and make sure every one of them makes sense to you. So please take a moment to take a look at these. And just to recap, where we've been with this lecture series so far. So we've covered all the nutrients that organisms need. We've talked about some generalities of nutrient acquisition and different types of trophy. We've talked about things for acquiring and transporting nutrients. And now we've talked about how plants acquire and transport nutrients. And finally, ending on this idea of Liebig's Law of the Minimum, how you can experimentally determine it by adding different nutrients piecewise and seeing how they influence or increase growth.
and then some of the practical applications of this idea of Liebig's Law, the minimum, to maximize plant growth and yields. So up next, we'll talk about how fungi and animals acquire and transport nutrients.